Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Mill Valley Film Festival contenders season. I'm Zoe Elton and we have a great show lined up for you here. Um, I'm thrilled that we have here hosting today Chaz Ebert, who's the CEO and the publisher of Ebert Digital, um, which we all know and love for RogerEbert.com, which is kind of the go-to go place for uh, great writing about film. Chaz, welcome to this program. And Thank today you. we are, it's all about soul. Um, it's always such a great event when a new Pixar film comes out. And um, we are thrilled to be able to talk with some of the, the key creative geniuses behind this film. Uh, we have Pete Doctor with us, who is the director and writer. Um, we've known him for his work on films like Monsters Inc. and Up and Inside Out. And I think you, I think you were writing at Pixar from the early days of Toy Story. So it's like you are um, uh, like a, a, a Pixar. Um, what would I say? Old man. I was trying to avoid that actually, but let's go down here. You are the old man Pixar right now. <laughs> and Peter's joined by Kemp Powers, um, who is the young man of Pixar, um, who's the co director. Um, and uh, Kemp is also having kind of an amazing time right now because he's also wrote One Night in Miami, which is also really a wonderful film. So I love that you're working both in animation and live action. And Dana Murray joins us, the producer of Soul, and um, who's worked on a lot of um, shorts um, and as a production manager on a lot of Pixar films. Um, I think you've worked with uh, on Inside Out, right? So, I did, yes. Yeah, it's all in the family. <laughs> so, um, Chaz, I would like to hand over to you and um, have a great conversation. Thank you. I, I'm really excited about this evening of conversation because uh, for, for many reasons. For one, because of all of the, the really um, monumental changes taking place in our world today, starting in, in 2020. And um, there's, I just think there's just a paradigm shift in everything and including the fact that I think that death is going to be seen as a new frontier one day. I think it's something that's going to be talked about in our society in a way without fear, that we're, we're going to be talking about things like the afterlife. And I never thought that I would see it in animation. So <laughs> the, I, I take, tip my hat to you on that. Uh, that you put it at something like uh, an animation. The other re reason I'm really happy to speak to you tonight is because, you know, Kim Powers, the first Black director at Pixar, is just phenomenal to me. And um, it means so much. And, you know, Dana Murray. A, a woman who's producing this is, I mean, it's just, it, it's just a piece of our time now and uh, in so many ways. And I'd like to start by asking Pete a question. If this is, I think this is something that I read that this came about, this film came about because of a, an existential crisis you were experiencing <laughs> in your own life. Is that true? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I fell in love with animation when I was eight. I've loved it my whole life, and I still love it. And, you know, there are times when you start to feel like, if I can just achieve this next thing, then I, my life will be complete. And I think everybody, in no matter what field you're in, kind of falls prey to that kind of thinking from time to time. So after Inside Out came out, uh, it felt like this is this is way beyond anything I dreamed of in terms of successes by any definition. 
So why don't I feel like my life's figured out now? Why does it still feel unsettled? And um, I just started thinking more about what is it we're meant to do? Where, what are we born with? What do we have a chance to adjust while we're here? Do we have a purpose? Is that a thing or not? So all of those ingredients went into the stew of, of uh, this film. And then we just started hunting around for ways to tell that story, to kind of get to that idea at the core of it. I have to tell you that I find it rather ironic that after making a film as successful as Inside Out, I don't mean just successful financially, but successful, it was so rich and full of emotion. And it was, I when I was in, I remember watching it and uh, at the screening where, when I saw that film, there were men sitting around near me and, and they were sn sniffling and, and crying. And I'm thinking, how can this have an effect like this on them? The, the same effect that it would have on me. Of course, I know that men and women have similar emotions, but after making a film like that, it seems like the fullness of, of the experience of doing that would have been satisfied you, but no, you had to take it a step further and I'm glad you did. Well, I, don't, I mean, I maybe it's just me being delusional, but somehow you always have this sense when you sit down to do something like, okay, this movie is going to change the world and everybody in it. And then, you know, it comes out and people like it, but you're like, yeah, but I'm still the same guy and I have the same problems. And so, you know, those are the kind of uh, elements that are at the core of this movie. Um, and it was a great opportunity to work with some really amazing people. And I think, um, well, we'll get, we'll get into it. Okay, yes. In fact, my next question is for Kemp. Hello, Kemp. How are you? Good. How are you? Nice to meet you. Terrific. I, this is another thing. I'm just asking things that I, I've heard. Is, this, is it true that at, at the beginning of this, Joe Gartner wasn't the main character of Soul? Right. Well, before I, before I came on board, you know, the part of Pixar's process is experimentation. So the idea, there was a question about who the main character should be, Joe or 22. When I first came on board, I, I think it's fair to say that 22 was definitely more developed and definitely more interesting than, than Joe Gardner. So there was a question of whose story this was going to be. I, I mean, one of the things that drew me to this project is that even though Joe wasn't fully developed, I saw him and his character in the journey through his prism as being just a wealth of opportunity, as opposed to, you know, of course, part of this is problem solving, but I didn't see it as a problem. I definitely saw it as a, an opportunity. And that was really a lot of the, the, the crux of the, convert, the initial conversation that I had with Pete and Dana. It was just talking about this guy asking questions and kind of using my own life experience because coincidentally the character was supposed to be my age and from the same city and from the same background. I just kind of started throwing these ideas out saying like, oh, and I could only, it, it was almost as though I was filling in, in my mind, all the things that Joe had gone through. And, and I think that's because Joe's journey is an artist's journey. And coincidentally, I was kind of living it at the time that they first invited me up to Pixar. Well, I, I thought it was so, um, I mean, the scene and, uh, in the um, shop when Joe is telling his mother that he is he, he has this uh, opportunity to be a full-time teacher and he has benefits and insurance and everything and she's really excited about that and then later when she discovers that he's that's not what he's can doing, dig it. <laughs> always talking about a stable life well that 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 I, I've seen that happen a time or two in the black community. Yeah, I mean, that was actually that scene at the in the second half of the film when Joe talks to his mother was the first scene I started writing when I came on board. And it helped that, again, it's a conversation I've had with my mother. So uh, the, it should it should feel pretty authentic because, you know, the very everything that we're doing from a lot of these jobs, we you don't even know exist in, in the community that I came from. So if you would have asked me at 10 years old, what do you want to be when you grow up? I didn't even know this was a job. They were, they were like, it was like doctor, lawyer, policeman, work for the phone company, fireman. Like they, being a, a writer or a director or a producer of feature animation didn't exist. So it's a, 
it, it's really, it really allows you to tap into this whole idea of being an artist and convincing those who care about you coming from a place of pure love that you're going to be okay yeah. <laughs> pursuing this thing that seems a little bit insane to an outsider. <laughs> I wanted to uh, go back to the theme and or, or, or themes of this because I, there are some Japanese anime that I, I love. Some uh, like, uh, I think it's Takahata's uh, Grave of the Fireflies and Miyazaki's uh, My Neighbor Totoro. And some of the, 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 the things that they explore are not things that you think of as cartoonish. I mean, they're very deep and heavy. And the afterlife is also something like that. But I think that you pulled it off very well. You, you kind of, you know, they talk about threading a needle and I think you really, you did it well, uh, all of you, but this, this question is really for, primarily for Pete and, and Dana. How, what steps did you take to try to make it an animation that's for the family but with adult themes, with questions about examining our purpose in life and why we're here and what happens when we're not here and still make it at a level where children can understand. Dana, why don't you, I'll get on my soapbox after you're done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, um... Pete always starts with these crazy big ideas that um, I think we all think about, but it is kind of fun to be like, okay, actually, could we visualize that? Um, and these big conversations, we always start from a place of research. So in development, we started bringing in all kinds of people from religious experts to shamans, to physicists, to, you know, psychotherapists, whatever it was, um, just to start dissecting these conversations. I think um, we always have in mind that we're making films for the entire family from, you know, two up to, you know, 90 year old grandma. And we, it's very important to us then that the entire family can enjoy it. But it always starts, I think, from a more, I guess, selfish place of like, what's a movie we want to watch. Hmm. And then I think along the way, I mean, I have small children. Um, Kemp and Pete have had children. We like so many people in that on the film have had children. So we have them in mind the entire time. And something we found successful on Inside Out is because um, there was the same type of questions of like, is this movie for kids? And um, so we had the entire crew bring in their kids for a screening. And um, we always learn so much from those because we're constantly asking ourselves, like, are they going to like this or understand it? And they always do. Kids like seem to usually be the smartest ones in the room. Um, and we've always kind of leaned on that because it's proven to be truthful um, from what we can tell. So, can we ask well, about what what age range were these kids that you brought in? Oh, I mean, super young. I mean, we just asked anyone with kids, like so super young. Like there was like toddlers. Obviously, they're not really understanding. They're more into the visual, but like up to. I mean, Kemp, you brought in your son who is in his teens. Yeah, I think the age yeah. was like four to four years old or 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what kind of questions did they ask or what kind of, I, I'm really curious, what kind of questions did they ask after they saw it? My daughter specifically, I have a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old and they really leaned into the conversations of the personality pavilions and like to talk about what pavilions they went to, what they did in the hall of interest, what would their museum of life look like? Um, so those are a lot of dinner conversations we've had, but they also really related to, I mean, e even though they don't understand the theme of like a midlife crisis, you know, um, they still understand Joe's story and have empathy for him and, um, you know, understand that scene with his mother and enjoyed the barbershop. So it is, I think it's for all ages. Here's, here's the typical conversation that happens afterwards. Yeah. So we sit, there's the kid and adults, and the, the adults are like, 
I don't think my kid's going to be able to understand this movie. It's uh, it's way too sophisticated and above them. And then the kid be like, I liked how Joe had a, a an essence of who he was and knew that he was born to be a musician. <laughs> but then he learned along the way that that more is, life is more about more than that. So like kids always get it. And, and somehow adults, I think we oftentimes we feel like, you know, we don't give kids enough credit. Um, they're pretty smart. <laughs> yeah. That reminds me of another, uh, uh, I remember another book, a Japanese book, I think it first came out in Japan, and then I think we made an American version of it. It was called Everybody Poops. Oh, yeah. We have a copy of that. <laughs> we have a copy of that, yes. Mm -hmm. I remember people said, should we, should we let our kids read this and, and <laughs> the word poop and, and, and what it's all about? And, and you know what? everybody poops and when I saw soul I thought and everybody dies and so it's something that we you know it, it, it should talk about and uh shouldn't be afraid of and I love how you made it the great before rather than the great beyond because there, I think you had more license to do what you wanted to do with it. Is that, did you find that? Yeah, we looked at a lot of different religions, talked to uh, with priests, rabbis, uh, religious as experts of pretty much all major religions that we could find. And only a couple had any mention about anything that happened before life. Most of it was about what happens after or during, which is actually interesting that you bring up death. I mean, um, I feel like the film is really more about life in that sense. You know, when when you think about part of this, the inspiration was this: my son uh, was going off to college uh, when right about the time we were starting this, and I thought, oh, I remember when he was little, and you know, he wait a minute, he kind of had a personality already, like when he was born. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, how is that possible? Where did that come from? Where did that personality come from? There must be somewhere else before life that gives us our sense of who we are, the sort of essence. And so that's, of course, uh, we're not the first people to kind of think about that, but I think uh, there was a real uh, freedom for us having not read too much about that idea, uh, for us to kind of invent stuff uh, however we wanted. The Actually, the first version of the film took place entirely in that space. It was all in the great before. But as we got into it and we said, wait, wait a minute, we're talking about like, what is life about? What's the right way to live? We got to go to earth. We got to show someone's life in action in a way that we can interact with. Um, and so that's, you know, the film developed as a result of that. Oh my goodness, the, 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 the graphics, the illustrations of New York, the life on earth, the neighborhood where Joe Gartner lived and where he was going to perform in the jazz show, so, beautiful i love that um the who was responsible for that uh, well large i mean we have a small art department it wasn't huge but steve pilcher was our production designer and so a number of us went to new york we looked around we went to jazz clubs and it was tough but you know somebody had to do it <laughs> and uh, we got to visit with teachers and musicians and that was hugely influential um, on not only the look, but the story itself. Um, you know, elements that you just, you'd never predict this kind of thing. But one of the uh, musician teachers that we spoke with said, oh, he actually, he, this is a guy who taught in um, Emeryville, George Spencer. Wasn't that his name? Yeah. You know, I just don't want to mess it up. Mm -hmm. uh, he mentioned that, you know, there, there was a kind of a rough um, part of town to go to school, the public school. Some of the kids, he said, they wouldn't show up if there weren't jazz. Jazz was the reason they showed up to go to this band practice. And so we thought, oh, maybe we can use that in our character of Curly, one of Joe's students who ends up, you know, giving him a job. So you just, you never know where you're gonna find inspiration. Yeah, I also, let, oh, and, and speaking of the, the jazz, which is so really wonderful, uh, and John Batiste, how did he, how did you get him involved in this project? And he, because he brought a lot to it. Yep. Um, I'll answer it, I guess. 
<laughs> We're all looking like at I'm each talking other. all the time, so yeah. shut up. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think we had seen Batiste on the Colbert show and started kind of listening to what he, uh, some of his albums. Um, I, can't, I think uh, one of our editors, uh, Robert Graham Jones, had had mentioned him. And um, so we flew down to LA to meet him. He was in LA for work. And we, the first time we met him, it was just like, kind of like love at first sight in a way because Pete pitched him the film and he was just, you know, I don't, if you know, John Batiste at all. He was, he was like screaming throughout the pitch of like, like just the exci- yeah, <laughs> the excitement. And he became a wonderful partner and um, really like he, he did a couple of talks for our crew, which were so um, educational and he brings great history to, um, he has so much knowledge of jazz, really like an encyclopedia and just talked a lot about his journey. And um, it was really helpful for Joe as a character. I heard some criticism of soul having the first major black character and then instead of keeping into his earth life as a black man he uh, was he was transformed into a soul and then his body was taken over part of the time by a white woman voiced by tina fey 22 the character 22 um how do you handle that criticism well, I mean, the criticism, you have to understand, first and foremost, from the story that we're trying to tell, 22's character isn't supposed to be a, a white woman. Uh, the character is supposed to be an unborn soul who has no, no gender, no race, no anything like that. So the, the criticism is founded in whoever is saying that their feelings about the actor we happen to have hired to voice the character, which is, which is Tina Fey. Um, But you have to understand that, you know, the story we're trying to tell was always a story about a man who died and tried to connect his soul to his body. It's literally called soul. So if you have a problem with Joe being in a soul form, then I feel like the only way that's going to satisfy you is if Joe isn't black at all. Um, But I also believe, and this is just me, that if Joe weren't black and it were a white guy who were a jazz musician, we'd have a whole other kind of criticism about cultural appropriation. And that's part of it is that we actually were incredibly sensitive to some of the, ma- of the, of the many racial things when, in the process of making this movie. That was the whole point of having not just an internal, but an external culture trust. And I tell you, when we gathered those culture trusts, you'd have 30 black people in a room and you'd get 30 different opinions on everything, but there was one universal thing that everyone in both trusts agreed on. And it's no matter what we do, there will be some criticism because the reality of it is, is that the history of animation has not been kind to black people. So for someone who is suspicious um, of anything new that's being created that has a black character, I think in many cases, there the people were ready to be, some people were ready to be angry before the film even came out just from the first trailer. Why does he have to be a soul? But if you really watch the film, you see not just Joe, but a whole wide range of black people. And I'm talking like lovingly rendered black people of different types, skin complexions, body types, a hair. And even when Joe is out of his body, we make the extra effort to make sure he is still present. And even when Joe isn't in control of his body, he's still in control of his body. He's really right there. So again, that's not to that's not to dismiss anyone's criticism. I think it's healthy to have these criticisms. It's a reminder that animation has so much further to go. But I'm able to sleep well at night knowing that this was an honest, sincere effort to tell a human story, a universal story. And I feel that we're lucky, I'm lucky that I get to tell this universal story through the prism of a black man. And you cannot argue that that character is a black man. And I and I think we're all lucky that um, that you were involved with it because it does have an authenticity. And uh, and you know, quite frankly, I love the film. I loved it. Thank you. It. So, let me get on to uh, something I wanted to ask Dana about producing. I I don't know if. What, what in producing, what does producing an animated 
film mean? What does that really entail? Um, I mean, the obvious things that I'm in charge of are schedule and budget. Um, I kind of the one who is building the teams. Um, at one point, our crew is up to 350 people. Um, I'm, I'm also helping with casting. I'm also creative partners with Pete and Kemp and you know the rest of the teams. And I'm sitting and edit with them sometimes as we're looking at scenes. Um, I, a big part of my job was um, organizing and uh, the culture trust and getting the consultants involved. Um, there was a lot of uh, cultural meetings that we had throughout the film. So that took a big, big portion of my time. Um, I don't know. It's like every day is so different. It's like you're being, you have a million things being thrown at you and you're kind of just like trying to keep a million balls in the air at all times. It is kind of how I describe my job. Um, they probably can describe my job better than I can. I mean, <laughs> what, how long did this film take from kind of conception to, uh, to execution? Well, it was a little bit of stop fits and starts at the beginning, but I'd say overall it was like four, maybe four and a half years, which is short. That sounds long, but that's actually shorter than we're used to. <laughs> it actually sounds short to me because I think there's so many um, elements. I, I, I'm actually surprised. I thought it took, would have taken longer. Um, and, and the writing, how does the writing evolve for you? That's, that's, it always changes a lot. And, you know, I think many folks, for me, uh, certainly, when you watch a final film, you feel kind of like, oh, it came down all here it is, you know, and really, it's much more like, we had this little idea, and then this added to it, and then this, and then we cut a bunch off, and we did, so it's much more like shaping with clay or something. Um, and for us, too, at Pixar, we have a, a process which is very unusual for, for screenwriting, which we call storyboarding. So we'll comic book the whole thing, you know, with uh, with a bunch of drawings, a couple thousand, and put that on video with our own music and sound effects and dialogue and stuff we record just ourselves. And then we sit back and watch it. And then we make t tons of changes and we do that again. So we have this process of, of kind of pre-visualizing the film cutting it all together before we actually shoot it. So by the time we actually say to an animator, here, could you produce this shot? It need, we'll be able to say, here's the exact line. It's uh, four and a half seconds or, you know, 32 frames or whatever it is. Um, it's very precise by the time it gets to production because it's super expensive. Animation takes a long time. On a good week, an animator can produce about four seconds. So it just, you want to make sure that what you're giving them is actually going to end up in the movie or as sure as you can. <laughs> that answer, that takes me back to your angst at after. <laughs> well, and, and this is, and I love this so much in this film that you or Joe Gartner realizes that his purpose and his mission and his spark were not all the same thing. And that there were things, you know, what the, the things that make life living are, are sort of an amalgam of things. And some of them are uh, more simple. You know, the, the, the um, I, I call it a leaf, but what was it that fell? Seed. A, propeller, a seed, a propeller seed? Yeah, it's a propeller seed that hmm. fell from a tree. And, because it takes so long to make, especially, you know, an animated film, and if you can only, you know, do about four seconds in a week, you have to know, I guess, where you're sort of where you're going to end up. But when you were writing this from the beginning with the ideas, what were the big ideas? Did you have the big ideas there right at the beginning or did they evolve as you were putting this together? Both. I guess for me, like the punchline, the, what I would say, the emotional punchline of the film where Joe, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, Joe sits at his piano having gotten the concert he had dreamed of his whole life. It feels like well, that was great, but I'm still the same guy. And so we had the scene of him sitting at the piano 
and taking this sheet of music off and putting basically a bunch of junk down and playing his life. I didn't exactly know how we would get there or what exactly he would say or do, how that all connect. But somehow that idea of separating, of differ differentiating your passions from your purpose in life. We often think those two go together, that they're correlated. But, you know, we have these talents, uh, but that's not necessarily our purpose, right? Um, and so that was the scene that was meant to kind of uh, be, as I say, the emotional punchline. Now, a lot of the other scenes we discovered along the way. One of the first things Kemp did when he came up was just start talking about black spaces, you know, as, as you call it, of like, we need a scene, if Joe's gonna have to play this gig, and originally we had him, he needed to get a nice suit. And Kemp's like, yeah, and a haircut. And I was like, well, no, I don't know, That's, I guess, maybe. And he's like, no, seriously, you need, he needs to go get a cut. And so he proceeded to kind of explain to us how important that is, um, as well as then, do the 40 rewrites of that scene that Kemp had to rewrite to, to, to really weave it into the story so that it belongs thematically to the character arc as well. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that you just discover as you go. The barbershop scene is one of my favorite, favorite scenes in the film. <laughs> and especially when uh, he's talking all of this philosophical, uh, uh, all of the all of these philosophical themes and he's talking about you know purpose and life and, and and the space that he was in and 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 he he looks up and everyone is transfixed huh. there are times uh to talk about that scene Kim well I mean again like Pete said it it came it started from this just this effort to bring cultural authenticity to Joe's character um, but, you know, this is still Pixar. So it, just because you want, it, it still has to work within the structure of a story. And, you know, we go through a pretty rigorous, one element of the writing that we haven't talked about is the brain trust. So everything that we do, we have to kind of put up in front of a, a group of our peers and let them poke holes in it. So in terms of that, that scene earning its place from the very beginning, it was a funny, it was amusing scene. There were elements of it that were entertaining people, but there were questions about the story, namely, what will our, our main character learn? You know, what actionable things will he learn about in the scene? So the most important part of the scene is actually tied to the barber himself, Dez, who is a character, you know, we created. And the idea was that Joe would have described Dez as a friend to anyone. But what we come to realize is that that friendship has been one-sided this entire time. While Joe has talked to Des about his life, he's basically been his personal therapist. He's never bothered to ask anything of his barber. And because of the body swap element, 22 actually asks a question that Joe's never bothered to do. And Joe learns something about his barber that kind of goes against his core belief that a person is born to do a thing. Because, you know, Joe believes he was born to play music um, and he believes that. Des is such a master barber that that must be the thing he was born to do. And we find out that Des always wanted to be a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, you know, not everyone is born with a dream, but they can still find satisfaction in their lives. So it was not just an important thing for Joe the character to learn, but it's then a lesson that he was able to apply several scenes later in the discussion that he had with his mom when he finally kind of opens up to her. So again, that didn't come overnight. That came through iteration after iteration after, and, 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 and you know, you can't get the good version unless you write a whole lot of bad versions of the scene. And let's just say, I think I wrote every bad version of that barbershop scene known, known to man before. <laughs> so the, um, and, and Pete, I, I know that the film is, um, is about life not about death, but uh, because it does explore some of those themes, you know, there is a song, I don't know if you've heard this song called, uh, there's a song called Roger Ebert that was written last year and it was up for, I think, for a Grammy consideration. <laughs> it was written by a, um, uh, a group of Clem, Clem Snide and 
it was based on, it's called Roger Ebert, and it's these are Roger Ebert's final words. Because when my, the day before my husband passed away, he had talked about going to this place where the past and the present and the future all existed simultaneously. Hmm. And he said that this is a hoax, that this, 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 this world that we live in is a hoax, that there is a, this, the vastness out there. And so I was thinking about hmm. those words in that song as I was watching your film. And that's why I had to watch it twice because it's so astonishing there. You know, there's also, um, Michael Newton, I think is his name, a psychologist who does like past life regressions. And he talks about life between life and where you go back and you get a chance to kind of go like through something like the great before where you maybe say what you're going to take on in this life when you come back, who knows whether that's true or whether that's how it works. You know, the Buddhists talk about reincarnation so much in your film that I've actually heard and read and studied, you know, um, and I wanted to know how, so it doesn't seem like that you did this, if, even though it's animation and whatever, it's not really done lightly. It looks like you actually put a lot of thought and study into it. What kind of research did you do about the oh, yeah. we we started let's see we talked to uh let's see uh let's see the pastor of uh, the the head of uh fuller theological seminary uh, i talked with a number of different rabbis um we brought in um experts on hinduism buddhism um we i think uh did we talk about this already that that we had a um a shaman come in from from uh from I think, oh yeah because there was one guy who taught at berkeley who actually studied shamanism kind of accidentally in south america and then there was another guy who lived in uh, marin so it was it was a, a great deep dive looking into you know everything we could find um to try to for one make sure we wouldn't offend anybody because actually my original plan was let's just offend everybody right and then that'll cover it but maybe not a great idea so we tried to you know not step on any toes uh in terms of deeply held beliefs that would distance people from the film to make them go like i don't want to you know you want people to connect with the movie but also then to learn as much as we could as clues to how we're going to visualize this stuff and as you say it's not done lightly i i i know that it's not like uh the cosmology if you will the sort of design of the film and placement of things is not theologically accurate to any one of those religions but um i think we were able to learn a lot about um how those different traditions view the soul how they uh lobby for what is living what are we here for what are we meant to be doing with our time so there, there was a, a great it was a great gift actually to me to be able to, and, and for a lot of us to be able to talk about this stuff all day, because it's not stuff you generally, you know, come to work and say, so what do you think? Are we preordained with an existence uh, and a purpose or, you know, it's not stuff you really generally pick up with, with people uh, at work. So it was, it was great. How did you determine what the, um, the lead souls were going to look like the, uh, in, the in the great before, the, the cubist, uh, Picasso Caldwell looking figures. Yeah, they're there. I guess Kemp, we, we talked about them in writing. They're the counselors, right? They're like the universe dumbing itself down for humans to be able to understand. You know, the universe is a complex place with 11 dimensions or whatever. And so now we need to kind of simplify it in something. Kemp, you described it like a scarecrow, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, when people make scarecrows, we think that to the crows, the bird, the birds think those look like people, but they actually look nothing like people. But in the counselor's <laughs> mind, they look like they're making themselves look like us. Oh. So that that was that's kind of the the humor of it is that, you know, it's like, oh, close enough. This is a where look, we look like a human, just like you. Does this calm you down? <laughs> Hello. So, I'm a human. Yeah. It's just a little off where you kind of go, what? It's kind of scary. It's um, the, 
the second time I, I watched it twice uh, because the first time I was so stunned that you were really uh, embracing all these concepts that I was marveling over that. So I had to watch it again to really predict the characters and what was gonna happen. And the second time just left me so overwhelmed with emotion. It's, it's, hmm. it's really beautiful. And um, I, what, when you watched it, and, I, and I'm sorry, I can ask Kemp or Dana this, but I'm, I, I think I was so taken with your having that existential crisis after Inside Out that I'm wondering, now that you've made Soul, how do you feel? I will say this, as we were making it, I was more nervous than any other film because it felt like, okay, this is pretty far out. Are we, are we really doing this? Are we making a movie that attempts to talk about kind of how to live and the purpose of life and, and all this stuff? It was, it was uh, and not to mention the cultural aspects of it, you know, it just felt like every day we were dodging, we were nearly stepping on a bomb and, and a couple we did step in, but we were able to kind of piece ourselves back together before the movie came out. So I was kind of prepared for it to be like, okay, some people will like it, and then a lot of people won't. So I, I, I don't know about you guys, I'm pretty stunned by the reception. It's just been so embracing, um, so many people. I've gotten more email from friends and uh, colleagues than any other film I've worked on. I think it, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say it's just been odd because we've just been in our homes. We yeah. haven't even we haven't even had a toast together or like with the crew. And so now that it's out there, it is really fun to talk about, but there's something just odd about it just because normally it's it just feels different. So I'm like still like I'm supposed to go on to my next project and I'm mentally like, what? <laughs> it just is weird. Yeah. Super proud of it. Sorry, Kemp, go ahead. No, I just, it's the same thing. I, I honestly was kind of like, I hope someone likes it. I wasn't expecting, um, I was pleasantly surprised that, again, some people might not like it. There might be some criticisms, but it's so overwhelmingly positive, the, the reaction. I think that that caught me off guard just because this film does feel like it's very different um, and, and, and very unusual and you worry sometimes that people, while they say they want original, unusual ideas, many times they you put those types of things out there and it's not received well. So this this has been a really humbling and, and awesome surprise that, that it's been received this well. Like when we found out that it's playing so well in China, you know, like it's just apparently like got some of the highest ratings of any Pixar film ever in China. Uh, it really speaks to some of these universal themes really connecting all, all over the globe. That, that's really encouraging. Oh, I have a question to ask about the name. Was it always called Soul? Because I loved it. I love that that it has the double meaning. There's this is a, a black man that the film is about. It's about jazz, and yet it's also about the afterlife. So mm -hmm. was that very intentional with the name, or? Well, Soul was the code name. I think the original code name was Glint, right, Dana? Yeah. But but when I came on board. All Pixar films have code names. So like Luca, the next film coming out was called Trio. And then at a certain point- Oh, Vespa. Oh, Vespa, I'm sorry, yeah. Onward was Trio, Luca was Vespa. <laughs> so at a certain point, you, we kind of like go out to the entire staff and people suggest name ideas and then we co co collect the best ones and everyone votes on them. This was an instance where when we got to the naming stage, Soul was still by far the code name became the most popular name. And I think it was because of the double meaning. I think it was because of that, the element of the music, the element of this intangible spiritual thing <laughs> became very, very strong. So yeah, our code name became our name. Very impactful. Um, the other thing that I, I thought you took a kind of, the, the, the lost souls and the, mm. where did that idea come from? I thought you took kind of a chance in in introducing the lost souls, but I 
But I think that for, uh, for today, and especially after a year that we had, like 2020, that the lost souls really resonated with me as well. Let's see if my memory jives with the ears camp, but I, my th memory was we were initially just looking for some kind of spooky characters because otherwise you just have all these very positive, upbeat characters. And we were looking for some kind of darkness just to balance things. And, and uh, I think it was Jamie or maybe one of the other story artists who came up with just these ideas of, and you know how like there's a lot of people, you know, uh, at the bus stop or was bus station or whatever, people that just seem kind of lost in their life. And so we were initially thinking like that. But as the film developed, we realized, wait a minute, lost souls could also be the very same people that we are. People that are so utterly uh, obsessed by whatever their passion is that that disconnects them from life. So that really became kind of a thematic in the film is that like to really live is to connect, to be engaged with other people, with uh, the world around you, with uh, just being observant and, and part of the world. So Lost Souls then came to represent the opposite of that. Great. And you know, I think the reason, normally, and normally they wouldn't be like some of my favorite characters in there, but I think that they were because I was thinking that coming out of a pandemic or being in isolation, developed so many lost souls in the world and mm -hmm. on this earth. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm publishing a book soon called It's Time to Give a Feck. And FEC F -E -C -K, stands for Forgiveness, Empathy, Compassion, and Kindness. And so I'm really looking at um, how connection in this world, and especially after the pandemic, really brings us, makes us more fully alive. And I think that's why your lost souls um, hmm. meant so much to me in this film. So thank you for that. Yeah. I, you know, the, the thing that I want to wrap up is to say thank you so much for trusting us, for trusting us, trusting children, for trusting families to be able to handle mature themes and themes that really are what life itself is all about. Um, our purpose and mission and, you know, connection with other people and, um, and, and what happens after, after we leave this earth. Thank you so much for doing that. I, I think Pete and Dana and Kemp, I'm, I'm, I just wanna say thank you. Well, thank you. I'm glad the film spoke to you. And uh, thanks for sharing the stories about your husband, too, because that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty neat. I'm going to look up that song. I know. Clemside. Meet Dr. Dana Murray and Kim Flowers. I've enjoyed our conversation this evening about soul. I think that you have made a phenomenally uh, enjoyable film and, uh, and very deeply meaningful in a spiritual way and in a in a very humanistic way so thank you thank you thanks for, thanks having, us. for having us